And they, uh, they get a really good appreciation for the work it takes to be able to uh, prepare and get everything ready for to speak for God uh, in behalf of uh, you know the nations, to help the nations, to help the kingdom. Uh, so so blessed to be able to see so many uh, young men and women rising up in the Lord in a great way. Uh, let's grab our Bibles and go to the Book of Luke. Luke chapter nine. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. It's definitely great to be back home. And being able to see what God is doing all across the Texas churches, yeah. and very inspiring. Uh, just so you know that both in Los Angeles and across the world, people know who you are. When you go to the GLC in the summertime, we all fly to Los Angeles. People will ask you, hey, so what, where are you from? I'm from Dallas, Fort Worth. We're like, hey. Oh, you're from there. And they'll ask you, is it real? Like, do you guys really, is what I see on Facebook, is it really what's going on now? You know, the kingdom is an incredible place where you and I get to live. The great prophet Isaiah describes it in this way. He says, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. You know, mountains, spiritually speaking in the Bible, were places where God would transform the ordinary into what is extraordinary. They would go up one way and come down a whole different way. I believe that the same will be for us this morning. You know, after the death and resurrection of Jesus, the book of Matthew records that the 11 disciples went up to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. It was on this mountain where Jesus would plant inside of the deepest part of their hearts a dream. A dream that really is his dream. And radically transformed them. Come on, bro. They came down that mountain, not as regular fishermen, yeah. because that's how they went up. But they came down as apostles of Jesus Christ. They knew that their time had come. They knew that it was their time to win their generation. Because Jesus was going to ascend into heaven. And so they did. They turned their world upside down. Well, this morning, I will remind you that that was their time. But now it's our time. We must go up the mountain. But we must come down a whole different person. We must be those who answer the call. We must be those who get the dream of Jesus into every single fiber of our being. Because if we do that, we will also be gloriously transfigured, gloriously transformed. Which is why I've been telling the lesson this morning, glorious transformation. My first point the road to glory. Luke chapter 9. We're going to pick up here in verse 18. Come on, bro. Okay. It says, once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowd say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But how about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, the Christ of God. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and he must be killed, and on the third day he must be raised to life. Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone's ashamed of me and my word, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory 
and the glory of the Father and the Holy Angels. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. What an incredible passage. The background of this account of Jesus with his disciples is the feeding of the 5,000. And here the disciples are with Jesus, and Jesus is interested in what the people say who he is. And they mention some great names. Elisha and some of the prophets. But then he is interested about them. Who do they think he is? And Peter, in his boldness, raises his hand and resolutely says, you are the Christ of God. Yeah, Jesus goes on to say and to help him understand what it is his road to glory. What is his role? But he says he must suffer. He must die. And if they want to follow him, if they want to get on the same road to glory, they must be willing themselves to suffer as well. They, as well, will have to carry their cross and follow him. This is about being encouraged that some who are standing here will see the kingdom. Meaning some will see the road signs and in one day it will say glory. And some will choose to get on that road and carry their cross daily and follow Christ. And others will not. Some will see the fear of dying to themselves and will fall into self-preservation and never seek glory. Yeah, you and I have the opportunity to define who we're going to be. And it's up to you and I whether we will get on this message and embrace it. Yeah. The message was heavy on their hearts. Imagine this. They're like, man, we want to follow Christ. We want to make it to heaven. We want to be with the Father. And Jesus doesn't pull any punches. He put it all on the table. He says, all right, that's awesome that you want to follow me. It's great that you're with me. It's great that you love the miracles and the bread and the fish. Yeah. And that everyone went home satisfied, the Bible says. Yeah. But that is not the blessing. It's not the road to glory. The road to glory is to live the way I live my life. And I was obedient to the Father. I was willing to suffer and to die. And that's what you have to be willing to do. Jesus takes his disciples to pray. He knew that he needed to deliver this message. And he needed to build their faith. You know, it's incredible if you keep reading here in verse 28. This is about eight days after Jesus said this, what we just read. He took Peter, John, and James with him and went up unto a mountain to pray. Jesus knew that when they heard that devil lesson, they came into devil one way, and boy, did they leave a little rattled. And he said, okay, I know how to fix this. Let's go up the mountain. And interesting enough, he does not take all 12 of them. He just takes three. Yeah. See, Jesus understood if he was going to change the world, he needed to work with a few. Yeah. It's interesting, after three years of ministry, the greatest preacher that ever been. You look at his church, and it wasn't a mega church. No. Only 120 members of his church after three years? This is the Jesus who parted the sea and, and did the miracles and raised people from the dead? Yes. Yeah. He understood that his time on earth was to build up a group of leaders that would have the same dream that he had and could replicate it time and time and time again. See, they're up there praying. Let's keep reading in verse 29 because something incredible happens when you decide to have a quiet time with Jesus Christ. Look at verse 29. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. 
and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke upon his departure, which he was about to bring the fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but, then, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory, and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to them, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. <laughs> the Bible says that when Jesus was praying, his face changed. His clothes became as a flash of lightning. In Matthew's account of this very same account, it says that his face shone like the sun. In Mark's account, it indicates that his clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. This passage is commonly known as the Transfiguration. What essentially happened is that the appearance of Jesus changed. It transformed. For a brief moment, they could see who Jesus was going to be like in glory. In all his reigning for just a second. You know, there's a joke that goes around that when you look at someone 20 years from now, 20 years, ready. like, what does Joe Bell look like 20 years from now? <laughs> Maybe everyone except Joe, but is that the most encouraging thing? Let's just be honest. Maybe a little bit depressing. Maybe except Joe. Uh, he, he does something. I don't know what he eats or what he drinks. But... <laughs> But what they were looking at was how he will look after his death. Yeah. Amen. After he would get on this road to glory. What would he look like? See, remember, the, the, the message of Jesus is heavy on their heart. He just told them, you got to be willing to die to yourself. That's the most encouraging message. Yeah. What is it to look forward to, Jesus? Why should I do this, Jesus? Why should I live this life? Because for a second, I'm going to let you see what I will look like after my own death. In Revelation chapter 1, John describes Jesus by saying his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Why was it important for them to see this? Because in a few days, Jesus himself would die on the cross. Yeah. And they needed to remember that although he will be all transfigured physically because of the physical challenges and physical suffering he would go to, one day his faith would be so radiant. In Isaiah, it prophesies about Jesus saying his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being of his form. Beyond human life. Wow. You know, the movies don't even do it justice, to be honest with you. Yeah. His face would be disfigured. You would not recognize who Jesus was based on everything he went. And the glimpse of glory that Jesus allows them beyond the cross enables them to remember that this road to glory is worth going down. It's worth me daily making this decision. And boy, did they do it. You and I have to look at the glory that God wants for you and I. And you have to make that same decision. Are you going to go up the mountain and let God transform you from the inside out? How was Jesus transformed? It says it when he prayed. 
There's something powerful, spiritual, and divine that happens when you actually go up the mountain to pray. Yes, sir. I don't care what character flaw is your deepest weakness. I don't care what who people think you've been and who you think yourself you are. If you are willing to get up in the morning, put your sneakers on, and literally go up the mountain, you can be transformed just like Jesus Christ was. You have that opportunity. You and I have that opportunity. And you will become someone you've never even, even understood. You've never even known this person. People will say, well, hey, what happened to you? Well, what happened to the old Carlos? Where are you going? Where are you? I went up the mountain. And I came down from the it. Many of us know who Blaze Pumba is. Yeah! Yeah, who is Just his name is incredible. Blaze. How could you go wrong with that? It's incredible. Our dear brother Blaze and his incredible wife, they lead all French Africa. Okay. French speaking Africa. Every single week, uh, Blaze sends out a report of what's happening in French speaking Africa. And it's like, 15, 20, 25, 30 auditions in a week. In a week. It's incredible what the Lord is doing in a great week in Africa. I believe a lot of that is because Lay lives in the mountain. I remember when he got called to go plant or send a team out to plant a, 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 a church in his home city in Cameroon. He actually was battling because his city represented his past. And he felt challenged in his faith. Can God work in my own hometown? What does Blaze decide to do? He literally, physically, walks up a mountain and spend his days there. Wow. Just praying and connecting with God. Wow. Asking God to transform him from the inside out. Yeah. I believe we've seen great miracles here in Dallas Fort Worth. Yeah. But imagine what God can do if all of us make that decision that we will not miss a single morning. Yeah. We will not spend no other more time more valuable than praying to our God. Asking God to transform us. Asking God to do something in us we've never seen before. Jesus, on his way to the cross, goes down this road called the Via Dolorosa, which in English is translates the sorrowful way. The way of suffering. You and I will never experience transfiguration. You and I will never experience transformation unless we first go through the road of suffering. Yes, there is no resurrection without a cross. You and I must be willing to get on the cross and remain there every single day. You say, well, bro, it's a, it's a little scary. Yeah. It's a little scary to look there. Some person will look at the mountain and be afraid. Others will look at the mountain and be filled with hope. Yeah. Because as you, heard, as you heard this morning, Rubiana shared from her life. Yeah. How many more Rubianas are out there? Yeah. Who on the outside portray something, but inside, they're broken and in need of transformation. I believe this morning, God is asking us to recommit. Yeah, come on, I believe God is asking us to get on the road to glory once again. Yeah, that our greatest days are not behind us. Yeah, rather that our greatest days are before us. Yeah, bro, but the cost to glory will always be the same. Yeah. I must be willing to get on that road. 
Let's go to Luke chapter 9. My second point, glory in being family. Look at Luke 9 and verse 29. It says here, as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. He sees Moses, he sees Elisha. Now they're a little sleepy, the Bible says. And Peter, bold Peter, love Peter, says, I know what we need. We need three tents. Hey, Jesus, I, 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 I don't know if we belong up here, but I, I, let me do it. Let me, let me get you situated. Let me get you nice and comfortable. I, I don't want to interrupt your meeting or anything, but let me just kind of set up the tent for you. Come on, Peter. Come on. The Bible says here that. He didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> Imagine. You're on that mountain. I mean, you're blown away. You can't even begin to comprehend what you're even seeing. Before Jesus, Moses was everything. He represented the law. He took the, the, the Jews out of slavery, out of Egypt. And Elijah was an incredible prophet. And they see this before them. And they see these two spiritual crankers. Nice. Moses wasn't always a cranker, though. Who was Moses? He was a murderer. He wasn't even able to enter the promised land. Yet you find Moses sharing in the glory of Jesus Christ in this moment. Wow. Elijah gets so overwhelmed at the calling of God that he wants to commit suicide. This is Elijah the prophet. He runs away and he hides in the cave because a girl is chasing him. She wanted to kill him. But he just killed a bunch of false prophets right before him on Carmel. This is the life. And he gets to share in the honor and in the glory of Jesus. Peter says something. I almost feel bad for me when I read this time. He always puts himself in a situation where he's going to get in trouble. He's that one brother you can count on to just put his foot in his mouth, you know what I mean? <laughs> he says, I don't think it's good for us to be here. I think it's good for us to be here, he says. He doesn't say, I don't think it's not good. I think it is good. I mean, that's bold. Yeah. What does that tell you about his relationship with Jesus? He understood that Jesus accepted him for who he was. Yeah. Come on. That he did not deserve to be on the mountain with Elisha and Moses and see the glory of Jesus in his, in his brilliance after dying and resurrecting, although he hadn't yet gone through that process. And he, Peter, gets to be up there what an incredible depiction of God's grace. Yeah. Yeah. I remember we were in an, uh, to a conference, you know, now that things are opened up more with what's going on around the world. Uh, many of you will be able to go to missions conferences around the world. It's incredible. I encourage you to do so. We, uh, I remember, went to a conference in Mexico City uh, many years ago. And uh, I remember, you know, we, we get there, and it kind of is kind of like church, but it's like church, like non-stop, you know, like 24-7 fellowship traffic, and you, you can't even move like one inch because you're just fellowshipping. You move from one way to another, and you just get stuck in the fellowship traffic. And 
I remember uh, we were at this conference, and Tim and Leanne, who you're gonna meet next week, they uh, they oversee our world sector. Which what does that mean? They they oversee. They have uh, responsibility to evangelize a respective area. So they they lead our church in Los Angeles, but they also oversee all the work in Southeast Asia. Uh, and all the dream churches, which is San Francisco, Sacramento, uh, Denver, Salt Lake City, the Texas churches. They also oversee all of Hawaii. Uh, so they have a lot of responsibility ministry-wise. And uh, now I had interacted with Tim to some degree at some point. But I remember it was, a, it was I think, a Sunday morning. And uh, I saw Tim in the front, and uh, he was kind of fellowship with some of the brothers. I'm like, well, you know, he, he's... He, he fellowship me with his friends. I don't want to I don't want to You know what I mean? Like he's busy there. I'm just got a lot of going on. You know, it's like, well, I'm not even one of the leaders, so well, why should I go talk to him? None of us can ever relate to this type of thing, right? right. Yeah. And I remember that uh, Jason was there and he was he, uh, when he we got back to San Francisco at the time, he wanted to put it as region leaders. But because they have a close relationship, and rightly so, uh, in a sense, like Tim got a statement, you know. So, yeah, you know, like we're thinking of putting the job assist to be region leaders. What? So, really? Really? Um, because I saw him on Sunday, but then you can come by and say hi. <laughs> and I remember that, you know, after that service, Jason came up to me and goes, oh, what happened? <laughs> He, he didn't go and say hi to your brother. I'm like, you know, it's Tim, I mean, he's busy, he's got nothing going on. He goes, oh. Says, this is how he feels. Well, the impression you give is that you're not there. Oh. And I remember, see, for me growing up in church, I was kind of basically a kingdom kid. Even though I got converted at 15. And I grew up very insecure, even in the kingdom. And that my identity would come from my role. So if I did not have the same role you did, I would feel insecure. And I would act weird around the fellowship. And I would only say hi to certain people because I kind of felt that you really want to talk to me. So I mean, I'll talk to you a little bit about this. I think we can talk together. And then, and then in the back of your mind, those who are like just trying to be family with you are like scratching their head saying, why don't you even say hi? Yeah. In this concept of being family, I need to learn yeah. to not live in my head. Yeah. Next Sunday when the curtains are here, yeah. don't be weird. Yeah. Don't be weird. Yeah. Don't, be weird. Yeah. Don't, be weird. don't be like me. Right? Don't be like in the back. No, no, yeah. Like, believe me, Tim, you can't miss him. He's super tall. Like, I, I haven't seen him. No, you have. He's like right there. You can see him. You see Leanne? Yeah, she's pretty tall too. No, I haven't seen him. No, you, can, you can see him. Don't be like me. Be family. Make them feel welcome. They've never been to Texas before. Show them what family is. Instead of Acts chapter 2. What you and I have in the kingdom is even hard to explain to others. So let's look at it together in the scriptures here. Acts 2. And in verse 38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. For the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are for all, for all whom the Lord God will call. And with many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They, those who got converted, they bore themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. 
Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together, had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods as they gave anyone as yet any. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It's incredible. This is the church starting here in the book of Acts. Yeah. And what picture do you see of church? It's very different from what church is today. Yeah. Today, church is a religious institution. Or I go, and I go in. I might have like the same seat where I sit every single week. And I might say like maybe hi to the ones that immediately right to my right or my left, but then I'm basically bolting out. And I'm going to get on with my life. Because that's church and then my family's at home. That's not how the first Christians viewed church. The first Christians viewed church and that was their family. They did not neglect their physical family. But they were so closely connected to each other. They were in their homes every single day. For some of us, it's hard for us to just leave our home and come to one meeting of the body on a Sunday. We don't understand family. And I get it. Maybe you're like me who grew up in a broken family. My parents got divorced when I was about 14. And I basically got raised by a single mother. And she served both roles. Eventually my dad came back into the picture. And when he did, he was basically the provider. Came home from a long day of work. He says hello. He asked me how your day was. And it better be yes or no or good or bad or whatever. And you go into your room and that's your relationship. So the concept of family is foreign. And you don't have to allow God's word to define for you. How it needs to be. There is glory in being family. Yeah. Family, when there's a need, we jump on it. Yeah. When even if it's individuals, you'll never physically ever get to meet. That's what any time from the pulpit or from a, a, a conversation, a brother or sister makes you aware of a need. If you're in a position to help, your desire should be yes, ask me, when, what time, where, how much. That's what family does. I believe me. Your, your mom calls you, hey, you know, your brother needs help. Wow, I don't know if I can help. And that's why maybe that's the type of relationship you grow up in. And it's hard for you to connect the dots when you're inside God's church. Because for a long time in my family, my own physical sister wouldn't even speak to my mother. So I get it. Our world is broken. Yeah. But in God's church, yeah. we have to be family. Yeah. We gotta be in each other's homes. Yeah. If you're married, open up your home. Yeah. If you're married, open up your home. Yeah. Like, and open your home and feed these kids. Believe me, I used to survive on two things. Now we go. Two things: pasta and baked potato. The cheapest thing. I don't know how I even survived. The Lord. Imagine. You see a brother and sister in fellowship. It just ask. Hey, bro. Says, when's the last time you ate? Yeah. Yeah. Honestly. It'll say, well, uh, you know, a few hours ago. Ask for them. What did you eat? Some of you campus students live in the dollar menu. You're like fired up because you keep eat, adding. Somehow they keep adding to the dollar menu. I, I'm not. Then you got like four nuggets and four fries and a milkshake. And then you're like, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Open up your room. Have them over. 
I appreciate the thing Murray's doing this. They're a great example. And you know Bob, uh, he loves to grill too. So he invites you over. You know, there's like a steak waiting for you, a chicken waiting for you, some shrimp waiting for you, something wrong. I'm telling you, let's go to Philippians chapter 2. You and I have the glory in being family. There's nothing more powerful in my mind. I think, I think, who was it that said? Oh, they said it last night at the marriage devotion. And that our marriage will be, for many people, the only Bible they'll ever meet. For disciples, we have a godly marriage with God at the center. Will be the Bible they'll ever meet. Because people understand that there's churches today, especially in our mental health. But to see a living Bible by seeing two individuals who are very, very, very different. And yet they not only just get along but survive, they're not just humans, but they actually love each other. It's like, whoa, that's, what's, what's going on there? It's incredible. The Bible studies are powerful. But let them come into your life. Let the world see what we have here. I mean, we have so many different flavors in this room of like ethnic background, economic background, height, quantity of hair. Some of us don't have, you know, hair hey man. But yet we can actually operate as one. Yeah. Philippians chapter 2. Let's take a look here in verse 4. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at that name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth, and under the earth. It's incredible. The Bible here calls you and I to let our minds be transformed and to have the mind of Christ. This is why for disciples, not being together on a consistent basis, it's foreign. It's strange. It's weird. Because our mind is like the mind of Christ. In the mind of Christ, understand that the church is the body of Christ. And they're all linked together. It says that in his very nature, being God, something for us to even try to grasp, try it, it's not very easy. Made himself nothing. Nothing. Just a servant. Just a man who is willing to give to others. Look, let me promise you something's going to happen in this church at some point or another. Like, this is a promise. Like, the stamp it, record it, put it on your note saying, Fernando said this is going to happen in the church. Alright? It's going to happen. Someone in this church is going to fail you. Someone in this church is going to disappoint you. Someone in this church is going to say something to you that's going to hurt you. If that was not happening, to me that's a red flag. Yeah. Because tell me what family, where they're not intricately connected, there's not some pain. Yeah. If we have such shallow relationships with such a shallow place, then we will never feel hurt. I never felt 
know her where I came from before. Because I never knew anybody. No one knew my life. No one knew my marriage and my children. No one knew the intimacy of my life. I actually kept them at a distance. I didn't want to know their life. You know my life. I'm here to listen. I'm a spectator. Not in God's church, though. In God's church, we know each other deeply. We know the good. And we know the ugly of each other. But because the church is imperfect, and you're still like in doubt, just turn to your left. It's imperfect. Like, turn to your left. It's imperfect. It gives you like enough proof. All right, turn to your right. That, if you didn't believe it, like, turn to the left. Look at the right and like, for sure. The church is imperfect. But when the church is your family, and you gotta can't separate it from like, well, this is my church family, and it's like this. No, no, no. From God's perspective, His people is one plot. Jesus viewed it this way. My family, my spiritual family, my own family. When my family hurts me, I don't simply give up. I don't run away. I don't ghost people. Some of you, either you're like the CEO of like the most top 5,000 fortune company in the world because it's so hard to get a hold of you. For some reason, you got no kids. You confess Jesus is Lord, yeah. then the church must be your family. Yeah. Look, with my kids, they're stuck with each other. Yeah. They have no say about any one of themselves. Yeah. Like, hey, Andrea's stuck with nothing, nothing's stuck with me, they're, yeah. they're stuck. Yeah. I'm sorry. And you better love each other. Like we're so different in this church. Yeah. I praise God for that. Yeah. And we're stuck with each other. Yeah. And it's up to us, guys, to adopt this mindset. The, the church, the family, this is our glory. Yeah, God. And we're building not just a church for ourselves, we're building a church for your kids yeah. and your family and the generations to come. So we must gonna do it. Let's close here. In Luke chapter 9. Some of you are like, what am I going to have to do? Yeah, that's what you say now. Okay. Luke chapter 9. Pray for you, bro. Luke chapter 9. Hmm. You have a deep name. That's okay, bro. Luke 9. Verse 34. Look what happens after. We'll close here. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them. And they were afraid. And they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I've chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and told no one at the time what they had seen. Imagine you're at the top of the mountain. 
And if seeing the glory of Jesus and seeing Elijah and Moses was not enough to just let your jaw drop, all of a sudden this cloud of smoke just comes and envelops you. And what you're experiencing there, as a Jew, you understood that the cloud would represent the presence of God. It would fill the temple. Anytime the cloud was there, it was God's presence. And in that moment, they understood where they were. In the Matthew account, in chapter 17, it says, they fell to the ground and were terrified. They're on their knees, overwhelmed by the presence of God. In the same Matthew account, it later says, Jesus approaches them and tells them to get up. See, the door to stand up in the presence of God is open to mere men, just like you and I. Wow. Come on, bro. You and I don't deserve to be in the presence of God. You and I don't get to have the entitlement that we should be in the presence of God, but we're allowed to. And what should be our only posture in our hearts? One of deep, absolute reverence. Yeah. Where we live on our knees, on the mountain of transfiguration, where you and I understand, yes, we're mere men, but man, we get to be transformed by the God Almighty. Come on, bro. I believe that for us, as we go into an end march with an incredible, glorious, successful, victorious women's end ceremony, yeah. and as we go into the month of April already, that yeah. I believe that the road to glory. The road to 200 for us here in Dallas Fort Worth. Yeah. That we won't hope it happens. We don't think, well, maybe it will. But we have an absolute certainty <laughs> that if we are those who get on the road to glory, yeah. no longer trying to preserve ourselves, no longer trying to live an easy life, a comfortable life, that we understand that we are in the harvest. This is the harvest season. Yeah. This is when you and I are on the field. We're scattering seeds and we're watering the seed and seeing God do great things. Yeah. This is the time for that. Yeah. That I believe when we all get together and celebrate the new year and before that clock hits 12, we can look around and say, we got to go to glory. We made God's family our glory. And now we get to see, just for a second, a glimpse of the glory of God when we see the many, many souls that will come into the kingdom. And we can all say together, man, we were transformed. We were transfigured. And now we get to share in the glory of God. I love you guys. Have a great day.